Uh, hi guys, it's uh, Keith Salmon here, and we are talking about million dollar stories. That's what I believe that everybody's got a million dollar story. And um, today we have a very special uh, guest. Her name is Susan Weeks, and she's from the UK, and I'm in Santa Monica, California, so that's a long way. But um, Susan, welcome. Thank you, Keith. It's lovely to be here, and thank you for inviting me. Well, great. Well, I know that, um, you know, story is what I'm driven by and everybody's got a story, obviously. And, and, but I think that not everybody knows exactly what that means to them and how they can use that. Part of, uh, you and I met uh, in the internet and we have something in common. You want to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So uh, you, you popped up in messenger one day saying hello. So we had to, had a chat. And then when I, when I worked out that you was a real person, then uh, I was quite intrigued because you are the first salmon that I've met other than my family because that's my family name that is my maiden name I was I suppose I'm Susan Salmon so that was quite hilarious when we had that little exchange wasn't it when we realized the other side of the world there we are a salmon because there's not many of us about I don't think no that's right no I didn't find too many salmons in my uh, <laughs> lifetime either but there's there's some of them out there but uh, uh, so that was that was great and my mother's name was Susan Salmon so that was uh, <laughs> even scarier then <laughs> yeah so we had a nice talk uh, that that time it was really great we were different uh phases of of development i, I had been in a transformation from uh, my career in filmmaking and uh, editing and storytelling and all of that stuff into getting into this industry and and you had been um really doing everything and anything and um you know i know the podcast was one of your journeys and uh part of uh, starting those conversations, you know, you and I had a common ground. We we had uh, understood that there was a, a gap in our industries in su such a way that uh, you fulfilled them, and you have something um, that's based uh, that your subject matter is on your um, podcast. That's very very specialized. Um, yeah. And, yeah. Tell me about that journey. Right. So okay. So the podcast. So here we are. Um, Stitchery Stories, that's a podcast. It's a podcast about textile art and embroidery. Yes, a niche subject for sure. Um, and how that came about was, uh, I launched it nearly three years ago now, and the standing joke was, I was like convinced nobody would want to listen. Who the hell wanted to listen to me talking to textile artists about embroidery? And the other thing was, would a visual subject work on a podcast so I was offering podcasting services at the time Keith and I strongly believed and I still do that if you're offering podcasting services you really should have your own podcast otherwise it's just theory um, so I looked around and thought right what can I create a podcast on the world didn't need another podcast about podcasting that was for sure so what's the advice it's always What's, what's, your, what's your passion, Over, overused word number one, what's your passion, what's your, what do you like doing, what do you want to do one about? And I thought, right, okay, textile art and embroidery, let's give it a go. So I did. And I launched very quietly, under the radar launch, with three friends from Yorkshire. So I'm from Yorkshire, on the east, I live on the east coast of, uh, of England, on the uh, Yorkshire coast. So I started with three friends from Yorkshire, and then uh, the next person was somebody who I kind of knew. And then everybody else, there was a few more that I kind of knew. And then everybody else, I'd never spoken to them ever before. I had no idea what their story was. And I typically find people, either they come to me increasingly now, but I would just go and find, you know, look on Instagram and find people whose textile art I admired. I had no idea what they were like as a person, what their art was, you know, what the if they had a story, no idea. And because this was done on the, on the side, as like a side project, I also wanted to make it as streamlined as possible and well, as easy as possible. So I have a series of questions that I ask the same questions. It's the same format every time, but the questions are designed to get a different answer. So it never gets boring. You never get the same answer again. Um, and, and so there we are. And then people will often say to me, Crikey, Sue, you know all these people. How do you know all these people from all over the world? And I go, do you know what? I don't. Only the first three. Everybody else, I've just gone with my structure, the confidence that we'll find something to talk about because it's something we love talking about. And 
there we are. And so now very quickly went global. And well, to be honest, it's every day. It's in Apple Podcasts, Top 200 in Visual Arts, in all sorts of places all over the world. At the moment, uh, looks for today, it's in uh, Top 200 in Visual Arts for uh, the USA, in England, uh, I think Australia, Taiwan or somewhere, somewhere new that I haven't been, been before, all sorts. The weird and wonderful places and the places you wouldn't expect. So there we are. And that's purely down to talking to people getting their story providing a structure so that they feel comfortable uh, and I think that's an important thing as well none of those people have ever been a podcast guest before I don't think any of them have ever done live streams um, so they've all said the same oh I'm nervous I don't know what to do and it's okay neither did anybody else and when I've said that to them they've all gone ah well if everybody else hadn't done it before then we can do it too so yeah that's in a nutshell the story right. of my podcast but do you, you find that when you can find people, um, their space of authenticity, just to be relaxed and just to be themselves, then they're interesting. There's a lot Absolutely. of, a lot Absolutely. of um, uh, you know, we experienced a little of that this morning. There's a lot of equipment around us sometimes that makes it very kind of like, how do you be yourself? And, and I've experienced that in, in, in the world of filmmaking because the minute that the lights camera yeah, everyone goes. happens, yes, exactly. <laughs> I call it they become they become scared cats, you know. Yes. And and, and um, so you have a conversational way of getting people relaxed, and that I I know that you know that that's a takes a lot of the edge off, and you have them, um, you know, acting like themselves, and then then you've got something, and you can get down to the story. You don't have all these barriers, barriers, these fear barriers. Yeah. yeah. And what I tend to do as well, Keith, is um, I would always start just with a chat because they're always terrified. Sure. And, um, you know, we'll all just have a chat and I'll just say, right, have you got any questions for me? Any of those questions you, you haven't got an answer for or, you know, whatever. So I kind of pick around, try and find out just to get a bit of background myself. And we might chat for 10 or 15 minutes and then they've forgotten that they're nervous because they're not nervous anymore because they've realized it is just a chat. And then I'll say, right, what we'll do now is because I only ever record the audio. I'll say, right, we'll switch off the videos um because some people are in like the back of beyond and their internet connection is awful anyway so if i switch the videos off then you get more bandwidth for the audio sure. and so then we go so then they're not even worried about kind of looking at me or we've already waved and said hello and chatted so that's what i do and that puts people at ease as well and then they don't even have to think about looking at a camera or you know what's going on they can just focus on the the audible conversation so that's i always do that have you ever found that any of your guests have become um like really interested in podcasts suddenly after they've had that experience with you um some of them have said in fact somebody on tuesday asked me you know what other podcasts can i go on i said well really in our niche there isn't that many to be honest but i, I gave her some ideas um so yes, and some have, you see, the thing is, it's a perfect medium for my audience who are textile artists and embroiderers, and they all listen while they are doing their stitching. So it's absolutely perfect in that regard, you know, and they all say, oh, it's really brilliant listening to other artists talking about their inspirations and the stories and, and quite a lot of, yes, there is some chat about different stitches and fabric and stuff like that, but a lot of it, to be honest, is all about people's journey, their highlights, their disasters, their dreams. Some people are just doing it as a part-time thing or a hobby and they want to create a business out of it. So there's a lot of business conversations kind of go through that as well. And we've had quite a lot of emotional stuff as well. Some people have been, you know, that had a kind of dream job and then they've become ill and they've had, they've had to change their, you know, the life circumstances have changed. So it's all sorts of stories have come out of it that I... I never expected, you know, for the way it's, it's, it's developed. I just didn't expect it. And I get people all the time sending me emails saying how, how lovely they find it and how enjoyable and how entertaining and how inspiring I am and all this. And I'm just, you know, I'm just this English person kind of going, oh, you can't say nice things like that. All right. <laughs> right. So, so yeah, are, you, are, are you a textile artist yourself? You have to. Um, well, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I call myself a, 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 a dabbler. I'm an embroidery enthusiast and a textile art dabbler. It, it's, it's my hobby. 
and to be honest I spend more time talking about it than actually doing it these days but uh, yeah I do find time to sit and create my my pieces as well but I'm not I'm not and never would be a professional artist in fact I wouldn't want to do it all day long it would drive me batty doing it all day long it really mm. would I want to be outside <laughs> right well you found a fantastic um audience you know the the niche audience is is un, unreal I've never heard of anything quite that I mean it seems like it's like as narrow as it can get but it's so wide you know it's 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 perfect yeah it is and the thing that dawned on me Keith and this, you know back to this idea of us being in transition and and, and I know you are you've been kind of moving and and developing your new thing and as much as I've been working online for 10 years then I've, I've iterated several times and my current one really started the middle of last year I got quite unhappy about the way in which the kind of podcasting scene was going I, I get a bit frustrated a lot of frustrated about the the lies, the over exaggeration, the hype about, oh, everybody should have a podcast. No, sorry, everybody shouldn't have a podcast. There's now over a million podcasts, unbelievably. And so many people just finish up wasting their time, their money, their effort, because they listen to this magic riches story. You know, if you want to make a load of money out of a podcast, if you need to make money now, do not <laughs> go and make a podcast. <laughs> Takes it, three years I've been doing it. Anyway rant over so I decided I wanted to build a more resilient and sustainable business and I just wasn't happy with where podcasting was going and uh, I thought right what can I do and so I've been looking around and the other thing I do I create a lot of is uh, online courses I really I, I'm, a, I'm a techie I'm a technical person and I create technical courses technical training courses is something I've done a lot of training goes through my whole career along with technology and I thought right I'll create online courses and then that's quite a saturated market as well. And then, of course, Keith, this was under my nose. Where have I developed an audience with really, it's organically grown with not a great deal of effort. And I say that in a nice way. Well, yeah, so I've grown this audience. All right. A lot of the people are hobbyists, but in there, in an even more niche is professional textile artists, most of whom who want to spend all day embroidering and doing the textile art and do, art very techy and don't know where to, you know, how to start. And so I thought, right, that is my perfect audience. You know, you get that, um, those Venn, Venn diagrams with your circles, you know, what do you love to do? What, what's going to pay you, blah, blah, blah. So in that really niche audience is my audience of professional textile artists. So I am going to, or I do teach textile artists how to create an online course. And um, I also then, for my bigger audience, entertain and inspire them to listen to other textile artists while they're stitching. So talk about a niche, that, that's it. It's under my nose and I've just ignored it for so long. So that's where I am now. And that's where I'm developing my business truly around my podcast. So that's, there we are, very niche. <laughs> well, that's great. Well, this is a, a, a question that comes from just uh, knowing you just a, just a little bit and seeing what you do. I know that you take care of yourself. You love to run and you get inspiration for being healthy and health, you're having a healthy mind um, and uh, an attitude. You want to tell me about, I mean, is that, is that like a, do you have a regimen? Is it something that you do like on a regular, um, yeah. have to do this before I come into the office, have to, you know, do you have a schedule that says that you are the uh, master of your health which means that you can be the master of your, you know, business. Yes. To, to me, self-care is exceptionally important. And this is, this is a habit of a lifetime. You know, when I, even when I was a child, a teenager, I, I love sport. I was a swimmer. Running, I wasn't so keen on. My friend was a really good runner. And so I used to go out with her just to support her. Do you know what I mean? But uh, it, so running, I've only started the last, oh, well, I suppose actually 10 years I've been at it. Um, I've always liked the outdoors and being outside and fresh air and nature. And I've always, you know, enjoyed healthy food and healthy living. So it's, that's a habit I've always had. And for the running, when my, so, and the other thing is the reason why it's incredibly important for me is I'm a single mum. So, and I'm responsible for my, is 15, nearly 16 now. So if I, if I go down, 
you know, he, there's nobody to look after him. I've got, I haven't got a business, have I, if I go down? So for me, it's, it is very, very important. Yes, I like a glass of wine. Yes, I like have some sweets. Yes, I'll eat cake every now and again. But generally, you know, I, I kind of stick to a, a healthy kind of lifestyle and fresh air. So I get up early and go running on the morning. I go running along the seafront over there um, in all weathers. And I wonder to myself, well, I must be insane here. It's freezing cold, raining, dark. What the hell am I doing? But do you know what? It, it, I think to myself, I give myself five gold stars for doing that because I think if I can get up at you know, six o'clock and go running in the dark along the seafront with a howling north wind in your face getting wet, I can do anything after that. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. So I'm nuts. If, yeah. If you were going to go way back um, to when you first came online, was there, any, uh, was there a, a transformational um, calling that you had to go online? Was there, was there something from your previous career or was there, was there some pivotal moment or like epiphany that said, hey, I got, this is what I have to do? <laughs> ah, well, talk about an interesting story. I, I don't know if you know this bit. Right, so I, I'm a techie. I worked at Nissan, a car manufacturer, writing co very complicated computer programs for them for a long time. I got headhunted and moved to another company and started doing a lot more training and uh, was doing technical training. And then, um, well, a surprise came along in the form of I was pregnant. And then I thought, right, what I'm going to do now? I'd already packed my job in by this, at, at this point, I have to say. So I packed my job in and then the week after I, dis I discovered I was pregnant. What shall I do? Um, anyway, so I finished up, toured around Europe in a motorhome, did all sorts of different things. It was, it was, a chance, I suppose, to think, right, I've escaped the corporate rat race at this point. I was pretty burnt out, so just whatever. And uh, finished up living in France, which was a totally random decision. And my son was born in Ireland, and then two years after I moved to France, utter whim, right? And I, I sound insane at this point, don't I? So my son, obviously, then was, um, you know, growing up, and he could start nursery at school when he was or I think it was, yeah, four. Uh, and France, they have very long days. So I was suddenly going, yay, I've got time for myself now. What shall I do with it? Well, I've got to start earning a living again. I can't live off my savings, uh, you know, for any longer. I, you know, so, right, what shall I do? So I thought, well, I'm stuck here because I was in like rural France, cows and apple trees all around me. What shall I do? So the choice at that point was, well, do I try and get a job in the local supermarket? Ooh, looky me. Or do I go to the chicken factory? Even luckier. And I thought, there's just no way I'm going to the chicken factory. No, not. What, 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 what can I do? What can I do instead? Okay, so you've got this like 16 year technical career here. What can you do with it? Okay, so I looked around. So this was in 2000 and kind of eight, nine, ten ish. And I discovered this thing called a virtual assistant. And I thought, oh, yeah, internet was a lot better then, although we still had dial up in rural France at the time, which was a nightmare. So I thought, right, I can do something online, surely. Discovered this company called VA Classroom, who were just starting out, who were offering training for virtual assistants. And I thought, oh, I can do all this. I'd already worked virtually through you know with, with international banks through my other company so I thought I can do all that anyway I've got all these skills what can I do so I started learning about the internet big style and um, finished up through the air classroom getting um, being an approved not an approved contractor with a company called Traffic Geyser who was earned by Mike Koenig one of the big San Diego internet gurus uh, so I was one of those and so that kept me busy so I was helping people who'd bought the traffic geyser software, but didn't know where to start in terms of getting it to work or had no inter interest or inclination doing it. So right. I helped them doing that. And then event what happened was then people would also need help with fixing things, internet marketing, email marketing, you name it. I've tried it and done it and worked it and sorted it out for people. So that's, that's that interesting little story and then since then that company VA Classroom changed into Freelance University so I've been involved with these people as a client for a long time then they asked me to be uh, one of their global mentors and we were having a conversation with the, the guy Craig and he and we, I'd mentioned something about training a few times we were just having a chat 
And he, just, and he sat there and he says, oh my word, he said, you have been sitting under my nose for years. I've been looking for you and I didn't know you were here in terms of your training skills. So then I'm also their technical trainer. So talk about a lot of hats. So that's where the training side of things comes in. And then I started a few weeks ago, I had that big epiphany when a couple of textile artists got in touch with me and said, hey Sue, uh, we really want to create an online course do you know anybody who could help us? And I went, don't, do you not realize? No, you won't because I've never said, that's what I do. I create loads of online courses. Oh, can you help us? Yeah. And so then since I then put my head over the parapet on my podcast and said, hey guys, this is what I actually do, you know, especially with all these COVID-19 things, people are now panicking. A lot of the textile artists have had all the workshops and events and galleries and exhibitions, a whole lot canceled. So now they're wanting to get online. And so that is now what I'm doing. There we are. That's a story for you. Oh, it's an amazing story. It's a, you know, I think if, if you're prepared to solve people's problems, like you said it a few times in our conversation already, under your nose, sometimes it is right under our nose. I believe that so yeah. strongly now, so strongly. Yeah. And I, I, I think that, you know, sometimes when you, you, you know, listening, one of the things that I, I, I spend a lot of time teaching is, is listening, the art of listening. And it's like, you know, you could be in the same room and, you know, the, the need could be there. They're just, the conversations are just missing. And, uh, but if you listen and you go, oh, I see that connecting point. I see what that problem, you have a problem uh, that I can solve. And, and then, or vice versa, you know, it's a two-way street. It's, it can work that way, uh, you know, creating power partner situations uh, can, can really be just about, about listening to someone you know, just tell, telling what's going on in their life. And, yeah. and you know, because they could have had that conversation and not, or, or they could have not had that conversation and still been out there trying to find out who's going who's gonna to help them. Yeah, it, it's quite often, I think, it's because we think, oh, I won't, oh, no, I won't say that. That's not a very good thing to say. Or, oh, no, I'll, be, I'll keep quiet about that, I shall say. Or, Oh, oh, I am going to tell anyone about my website because it's a shambles, you know. And and I think sometimes it's those things that I, I say I've discovered all sorts of things about my guests, and I've has been having quite a lot of purposeful conversations with them about saying, right, well, especially, you know, what is it that you want? How can I actually help you? It's okay saying you want to do an online course. What? Where are you stuck? What don't you know other than everything? Um, and 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 just by having that conversation, and just letting it go where it goes you can discover all sorts of things and i find that absolutely fascinating you know i really right. i really love actually it's one of the things i'm quite an introvert nobody ever thinks i am but i really am and um, but just the opportunity to talk to people from all over the world i think is just brilliant and to be able to work and i encourage anybody and everybody to just stop telling yourself the story of women are terrible at this and especially women of my age Oh, I can't do technology. Oh, oh no, I let my husband do it. And I'm going, oh, no, you can. Stop it. Stop it. I can teach you. I can really teach you what to do. Don't please tell yourself that story, another story, and it's wrong. You can. You can do it. You just haven't found the right person to help you. So, you know, that's something I get quite passionate about. I just well, don't like people to diminish themselves in that, in that way. Well, I think so, you know, it's a it's a tiny little fear thing that they that they can't really kind of get through. They think they have to master it. You know, they don't have to figure out how to build a computer. They just need to know a few things. Oh, I, I have an experience with some. I have a, a business that I'm working with. Um, some some folks that are are not really say Zoom friendly or you know that kind of thing is a big leap. And I said, you know, we have to have one of these meetings. We've got to do it on a Zoom. And there was a little bit of resistance and then um, they said, okay, all right. And then we had it and we had, um, we had, I don't know, uh, 40, 30, 30, 40 minutes of us just finally, all of a sudden we could all see each other on the call. And then by the end of the call, it was like, <laughs> hey, this Zoom thing is pretty cool. Great. And, and, and it's, you know, it's got its, its ups and its downs, but it's, it's gotten better. You know, the, the, um, the idea that once they, I guess the point I was saying is once they experience it, um, once they experience even the things that you'll teach them and show them, yeah, I mean, some of it's complicated, but it's, it can be a lot easier if you're trained on it. 
it, it really is. And I've spoken to quite a lot of people. I mean, even, you know, funny about back to Zoom, in the beginning of March, I thought to myself, right, I've had it on my list. I'm going to do a Zoom course because there's, you know, a lot of the settings were all hidden and it, things are different now. They've made some changes to the way it's presented. But I thought, right, people are wanting to get online. This is an easy way for them to do it. They can use it to record presentation, all sorts of things. And so I was just kind of putting it together when, oh, lockdown, and everyone was just like, panic, panic, panic. So I did actually, and I, I thought, oh, it's going to look really awful now that I've like created this course on how to use Zoom like properly, um, how to understand all the settings, how to whatever. And I thought, it's going, to sound, it's going to sound really awful, isn't it, now saying, oh, well, you ain't buy my Zoom course. Um, and I, in the end, I thought, no, because it's awful for me to sit there on something that can be really helpful, that can make, make or break somebody's ability to move their business online. Right. I need to say to people, I've got this, even though it felt opportunistic. I'd already started doing it. It was just one of those, I could see what was happening. I thought, oh, this is going to be handy. So, so I think as well, when you're listening to people and trying to help them, I think we also have that kind of a duty as well. And as awful as it always feels to ourselves to put ourselves forward, say, hey, I've got a Zoom course, by the way, you know, I can really help you do this. Or, hey, I can help you with MailChimp or I can help you with this or that or the other. And that's something I've really struggled with, Keith, is that um, I don't know what it is. I just don't like, it feels if you're asking, and I hate to ask people for things, but now I think I'm offering them a plate of biscuits. Would you like a biscuit? We don't get upset about that, do we? No, thank you. I don't want a biscuit. Well, yes, please, I will do. It should be the same. So that's, uh, you know, that's how I try and look at that, uh, that side of things. Well, I think you can offer somebody something that will help them, but you can't force it on them. You know, and so yeah. I, I find that it's, it's kind of a, you know, if you see somebody walking down the street, I mean, it's a kind of a crazy analogy, but I mean, you see somebody walking down the street and you can just, you can figure out that they really need what you're offering. That guy could really use my program. You can't run up to him and say, you've got to get your life together. <laughs> work with me it's an intervention and nobody likes intervention no no um, no but like the um the, you know those people who came in as like a you know pod, you know the 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 three people that were right under your you were right under their nose and it's like the opportunity if it's there for you you've got to tell them i mean it, it is like you say it's your it's your duty i can help you with that and it's just a matter of, of personal style people have a style uh that they have with connecting with people on you know you know getting getting business and, um, but if you're, I think the primary, uh, I think a lot of the early discussions that I have with people is talking about their goals, you know, what are goals and, and yeah. what are, what, you know, is making money a goal? I mean, that's a sort of a byproduct of a goal and maybe a healthier way of looking at it. Of course you need cash flow, but, um, you know, you sort of just have to kind of separate those conversations a little bit and, yeah. and, um, yeah. You know, if you feel a need for somebody and create a value, they'll give you some value back. I know. So the other thing that I've really discovered over the last couple of months as well is when I actually came out and said, this is what I do. I know, you, I know we're here to talk about art and embroidery, but by the way, if anybody needs to move the business online or I'm here to help, that's what I do. And I'm moving the podcast to be the center is the hub of my business now that's what i'm doing and since then i've had lots of people come to me hey sue can you help me with this hey sue can you help me with that yeah i'd love to be able to you know uh, help you to guide me to create an online course so that's kind of really where i'm focused at the minute and that has been the best other than when i was on that professional directory and people came to me hey sue can you help me it was that but now since I've actually got up and started to tell my story in terms of my technical skills and how I can help my audience, people then come to you as well, which really makes it, if it's very validating, isn't it, Keith, when, when you, know, you must get exactly the same thing. But, hey, Keith, you know, can you help me with my, getting my story out? You've, you've been doing documentaries and filmmaking all this time. You've got those skills, which you know, I think is brilliant to be able to do that as well. Well, thanks. Yeah, it is. It is rewarding. It's it's great to see some some. Uh, it's great to see them ask you once they know. And I guess Absolutely. that's what, what you talked about is like the hub and the headquarters of of the podcast for you is like you have an audience, and they have you know each one of those people have an audience, right? 
I mean, exactly. in, even if they're not in this business, but they have people, you know, so the reach is further than just that one person. And if you have that message and you're, you are the person who's always there for them, you know, they'll eventually come around or, or they won't, but it, it, it's, that's all you can do at a certain point. Yeah. And the number of people who actually, you know, listen to get in touch with me and they just say, Oh, I've been really inspired by that last week. Or, um, there was my, my most recent guest or second recent most guest. What a lovely lady. And she had no confidence in her, her, she couldn't say she was an artist, really creative, lovely person spend all the time caring for others. And she, she said, since this is not a lie, so she said, being on your podcast, she was over the moon when I invited her and it was her birthday. It was a big moment for her as well. And she's just like, I've got the confidence now. She sent me an email yesterday. I've got the confidence. I turned around and said, no, I wasn't going to look after X, Y, Z person just because I was a family member. I'm an artist and that's what I'm going to do. And she said it was being life-changing. And I never set out to be life-changing for, you know, anybody. But so many people just say, oh, you're in our heads. We think, you you know, you're our friend. You're my friend in Yorkshire. And, you know, these people from all over the world. And it's just the connections that you can make when you stop and listen and just do your best for people is, is, is astounding, I think. You know, it really is. And that's where I kind of coming at things. And I know that's your philosophy as well yeah it is thanks thanks for saying that um could we go back to say um when you know you you started the podcast you decided that that was what you you know if i'm gonna teach it i should live it right kind of in that sort of um idea so how how did you go from three people that you knew to 93 people that you 90 people that you didn't know <laughs> How did that, that first moment of like getting it out there? And 130,000 downloads later. Aye. Um, how did it get out there? I think I just said, uh, here's my podcast. <laughs> it like, sounds really lame, doesn't it? What I, I, I shared it on Facebook and a few of my embroidery friends found it. Um, the two, one of the guests wasn't even a textile artist. She's, um, She's into teaching people how to do um, couture, you know, dress baking and so on. So the first two shared it with their embroidery friends. I shared it with a few of mine and it, it, it kind of grew. The thing is, because I'm, I've worked online for a long time and I'd taken the time to understand how the podcast directories work and I knew all about optimizing things then it was straightforward for me to think, okay, I'm going to optimize this textile art podcast, embroidery podcast. There wasn't any and, and no such term existed. Um, now when you type those in, my podcast types pops up all the time. So people were looking for, and I also made sure I'd created um, the, the website for stitcherystories.com and I posted the episodes on there. So I knew that the, uh, anybody who was looking for something to do with embroidery and textile art, I would, my website, the episodes would pop up. If anybody was in um, a podcast directory and searched for embroidery and textile art, they would find it as well because a lot of people have never bothered to do the online, the, the website side of things. They just relied on being discovered within a podcast. Most of my listeners had never listened to a podcast before. So if you're in that situation, you got to think, where are people and how are they going to find me? And a lot of podcasters didn't and haven't done that because they don't know. And nobody's really explicitly explained a lot of this thing either. It gets lost in the hype. So it was a combination of friends sharing it and understanding how search engines work and optimizing. And word of mouth, that's how it spread. It spread organically pretty quickly. I was so surprised that Within a couple of weeks, I was getting listeners in America. I was getting listeners in Australia. A lady from New Zealand is a real, she's a brilliant fan. She emailed me and it turned out that she'd, um, she'd, she was in an embroiderer's guild in one of, the, one of the cities in New Zealand. And my first guest, Alison, 
had actually had done a study tour and had gone and spoken to that guild. So she'd actually, she, 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 she emailed, she goes, oh, it was lovely speaking to Alison and I'm really glad I found her podcast. So there was little connections like that, um, you know, popped up uh, in different places as well. So yeah, Instagram was another one. I, I, I quickly thought, right, if I'll, um, I'll brand up my guests' artwork images, put their URL on, but it had Stitchery Stories logo on it. Um, and I started sharing those. And so that was an easy way for people to, oh, that's nice artwork. And then I had a, a, a way to easily from Instagram, click on the link in bio. It took them to the player for that episode. So because I understood a lot of the technical stuff behind how you make all this work, then I made it easy for people to listen, knowing that my audience were not podcast listeners. And a lot of them were ladies of a certain age who really didn't know how to navigate all of this either so a combination of connections look and technical knowledge there we are rambling answer no no but you but you went ahead and made it easy for people you know i made it easy for people and, and, and that's that part is of... why it's it's worked really well i made it easy for people i've made it easy for my guests and i've made it easy for my listeners and that's what i say to people in terms of creating online courses i it's like your guide, you know, your classic stories and movies. There's a, the, the hero has a guide. I'm the guide. I will guide people through a plan that works and I will teach them what to do. I am the guide. So that's what I always look at. And how can I make things faster and easier for people? Right. You've been there and you've done that. And, <laughs> you know, why, why go and discover it, you know, on your own? No, nobody awesome. needs to. Nobody needs to. Mm -hmm. People like me, I love discovering things. I love tinkering around. I love, I, kn I can look at something and I kind of pretty much know how it works, which sounds odd, but I, I do. There's only so many ways a lot of this software can be written anyway. Mm -hmm. I've written code that writes code. So I've got a good idea of how it all works in the background. So mm -hmm. for me, it's, um, it's, it's just something I can do. And I never understood that that is something that so many people can't do. You know, a lot of, a lot of the things that I've realized I have a gift for, I've only really understood, uh, you know, later on in life. I've never fully appreciated the level of skill that I, that I have. Well, I think that a lot of people, some people don't. Some people have this whole thing. When they try something new, they think they got to dump everything that they've done prior. And the fact is, is that you have to bring everything that you've done prior to what yeah. you're going to do next. And sure, you know, the part of part of the first part of in the journey of the course that I am teaching is about, you know, discovering the good things. And the, you know, it, a lot of people get hung up on just the bad things, the things that are kept you in, out of action and kept you in fear or whatever that is for you, basically blocked your progression and your development, and then. They get, I, I, I say you don't get stuck in there. You don't, we, don't, we don't dwell there. We just like put them, I actually, I always have some of these, these like three by five cards in here. You know, it's totally old school, but it's very, it gets it out of here through your hand onto the paper. And it says, this is something that stopped me for six years of development, arrested development in whatever category it is. And it just put it in the pile there. And it, it all of a sudden it has so much less power in your life. And, but, but instead of that type of a, of a, you know, that's in the in the bad pile. The used to be bad. I always we talk about it in the past tense, and then um, I think people in that part of going backwards and telling the story, they get stuck in those only the bad parts. They say we have to identify the good things, all those things yeah, we you were just to. talking about, and you get into these discussions and you go, and they say, well, I know how to, I, I know how to do this. I know how to build this, I know how to do these things. Well, and I'm like, well, I've never met anybody who knows how to do that. So that's supposed to, we have to acknowledge that. And you bring, you're bringing so much to the party here that you're not giving yourself credit for. And once they believe that, yeah, the light bulbs go off. I call it owning your story in, in the course of that. When you own it, you believe it, then it has worth and invalidation. So and, something that I've realized that is, is quite a strong theme through my whole career is I really want to empower people, particularly women, because I, I suffered a great deal of discrimination when I, um, when I started my career. 
I worked in a male dominated environment in a male dominated car factory in a quite a male dominated kind of traditional area. And I wasn't prepared for the level of discrimination I got just because I was female. Mm. And it, it, cracky, it made me so angry. And I mean, I just kind of pushed through that and carried on and, and, and all the rest of it. But I, it still pains me today that people suffer from discrimination in whatever shape, way or form. There's, there's no need for it. And I'm particularly, as I say, particularly I want to encourage women to stop telling themselves a story that they can't do these things because, and that's someone even pointed them out to me, it's something that we tell kids and I think is very powerful is when somebody says, I can't do that, I, 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 I can't, I can't, I don't know, I can't do technology. Then you put the word yet at the end of it. Well, you can't do technology yet, but when we're finished, you will be able to. So I think the yet is a very, same kind of thing, very powerful, right. powerful right. statements. But again, it's, it's when, when I look at why am I doing a lot of these things and I spend a huge amount of time helping textile artists, you know, three years basically giving people free marketing, free, free platform. Um, why have I done that? Because there's so many talented artists who are sat there not able to build their platform, not able to develop their market, not able to um, get, you know, earn a decent living out of, of fabulous skills. So you know, I begin to realize, the more I've sat and thought about a lot of this, that um, there's, there's a lot of things I've, I can bring to the table just from my experiences. And I say it's back down to faster and easier. I just, people don't need to suffer some of the, stupidity that i did the, the sun's shining directly through my blind at the moment now so i hope oh. i haven't wiped out too much <laughs> no it looks good it's great <laughs> so my, my halo <laughs> right yeah no that's it uh, uh, giving you know i always one of the things i said if you if if i can let's see if you do something uh, i i can't remember exactly what it is but if you listen to my story i can save you a lot of trouble <laughs> i can tell you <laughs> <Yeah>. that <laughs> And, you know, it's like there's anybody who's discovered anything, you know, the, the new latest, you know, um, success story that's, uh, you know, overnight successes are not overnight, generally not overnight successes. The 25 the 20, year 20 years. <laughs> so if you can, um, if you can bring some people along, you're a leader. And then down the road, they'll be leaders. Yeah. It's just part of the human condition that, that we want to do. So, um the um, I guess we talked about the conversations, but it, it is just conversations when you get to you find out what people are passionate about and what they, you know, some of those past skills or those past careers that they sort of they have maybe a bad feeling of how things turned out, so they just don't go there. And I'm sure um, I think that one of the things that um, uh, you might come across is the people that uh, say raise their families and you know women is particularly who 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 may have gone to, got a great degree, and, and then they just sat on the sidelines for 20 years. All and, the time, all and the, the time. And, and yeah. they, they need to know that it's never too late to, to make a change and to bring all that stuff that you, even that life experience of being a parent is something that you can, you bring into your, the next phase of your life. And all things are possible when you, when you t dig in and, and, um, and actually, and get help from, you know, the hardest thing to do is ask for help. It, it truly is. And there's been several, several, in fact, more than several, a lot of my guests, when we started talking, they've had the, well, some of them kind of went to art school or, and thought, no, no, getting a job as an artist, that's never going to work. You know, I've got to go and be an engineer or a math teacher or something. So then the families come along and they've always put themselves last. They've put their creativity and art to one side. And then it's, you know, they've got to kind of late 40s, 50s and just thought, hang on a minute, it's my time. My kids are old enough now to go and do what they're doing. Um, you know, they're like, right, I'm sick of that job. I've hated it for 30 years. Off, I'm... I am now going to follow my dream and be an artist. I've had loads of those conversations, mm -hmm. absolutely loads. Mm -hmm. And what I also find really, really amazing is I've had several guests who are the most fantastic artists, regardless of whether they're working in thread, paint, they are fabulous. And I've had at least two that I can remember who've sat there and said, I didn't know I could draw. 
I didn't think I was arty. I taught myself to draw. I've never drawn anything before. And these people are the most amazing artists. And you think, how do you get to the, you know, your, your forties and suddenly discover that you have this amazing talent for drawing and illustration and, and, and art or yeah. they've taught themselves. And you say, well, you know, I've just taught myself how to do this. Wow. You know, some people have spent years I mean, classes and things and it's just, and that blows me away that there's still, people can still get to their 40s and their 50s or probably even later and have no idea that they've got this, these, these talents that they've been blessed with and that have been ignored and the world hasn't been able to benefit from them. That's, that's, that's really interesting. And there's, there's reasons why we get into their, our, say our first phase of our careers or anything like that. It's like I, in film editing, I, I became, there was a, a thing that we did in college, the whole, the whole major in radio, TV, film did this commercial. They did a Sears commercial. It was like, you've read about it in the newspapers, one of the, just a, like a retail ad, but you had to do it on camera. And I literally remember, I can remember it just like it was yesterday, that it was halfway through that moment of being on camera. I go, I, this is not, I'm not going to, this is not for me. <laughs> I'm not going, you know, so <laughs> I found my way through um, music production and radio production and, and, and found my way over to editing and, and then eventually into picture and sound editing. Um, it was a very comfortable place for me to be, to be behind the scenes, to not be in the front. Um, but then, you know, I kind of like in the sort of uh, evaluation of what I, my skill sets was, I thought of myself as an editor, you know, that told stories. I was, I was a great storyteller. I, I knew that I was a really good storyteller. I you know I was given great material. I was really blessed to work with those types of people. But uh, the people skills, I was always um, uh, very good at, but I never gave myself credit for being good at because in yeah. that world of advertising and films, you know, you have to present that work. You have to present your work. And I would have like out of body experiences when I would turn around because if I know the material, I can have that conversation. In college, when I dropped speech class a number of times, I think six times, it was because I didn't know my material. And I got nervous and the anxiety of going up and not knowing what I was going to say was really tough. Yeah, and, yeah, and, yeah. But I thought it was more of a public speaking anxiety, but was more, it was complex because it was a public speaking anxiety because I didn't know what the hell I was talking about. Yeah, yeah. Um, but so what really was a, uh, a good thing for me to realize, to give myself some validation is like, I would turn around in a room and realize I might have 10 people that I'm presenting to, which is a lot of people. And I would have to organize that room and take and actually control that room because if it, if you lose control as a film editor in wherever you are you've lost the the, the ship starts to sink and yeah, and yeah. so i i uh I had to really um understand those things i've experienced those myself and that's what i i, I tap into you know it's like if you've got a room full of people and you share your stories and strengths you know you're going to identify with somebody and if yeah. you, i think that that's part of what our new um, world of, of marketing and, and um, uh, becoming, getting audiences is about, is about repetition and, and, and it's about uh, consistency. So that, cause they're not gonna see you for that, that first time, they may only catch you um, for a uh, half a second and, but they might not have time, but you know, it's like driving down the freeway, you're gonna see that billboard and you might at one point be in a little traffic jam and you'll be able to look at it for more than a split second. Yeah, and and yeah. then it's a connection of the, I mean that story is fascinating to me that you can see you can sometimes hear the same story a hundred times before it connects with you, and um, so that's why we have to keep putting our stories out there. And we do, and that was a big lesson to me. Although I've worked online for all this time, was was when I, I suddenly realised when these people were saying to me, "Do you know who could help us with online courses?" and I thought. Well, don't, don't you know that's what I do and then I thought no so they don't know because you sit and chat about textile art and business and stuff like that but you know nobody ever really knew what I was talking about or what I did you know to actually earn some real money so right you know so it was like well why haven't I never said it before well because it wasn't my focus my podcast was like this thing I did on the side it's like oh it's entertaining for everybody and oh isn't it nice and and there's me there thinking, well, I've got to do something with this. I can't keep, you know, I'm not here as a paid charity entertainer for the world, am I? You know, I've got to do something else with it. 
Um, so yeah, that was that was a big go. Oh, why have you never said? Because I've just again okay, under my nose, and when, mm -hmm. when you actually start to say, and and in you, you yourself, you know, it, it's it's people then will come to you because they like you, and if they don't like you. Well, good, because they're not your people, so you don't need to waste your time talking to them. And right. that's something else you've got to be quite almost hard-hearted about. You know, you're not talking to them. Don't worry about them. Let right. them go. Right. They're not right. your people. Yeah, I mean, you can't serve, I mean, there's, what is there, six and a half billion people on the, you know, how many do we need? We can't help <laughs> yeah. them all. Um, so if, um, I, I really, really appreciate you spending the time um, fighting through our little technological yeah issues speaking of technology and I will take the blame for all of that but um, if we were I will get the information out I of course going to rebroadcast this uh, our, our talk and um, you'll give me some places where people can find you and uh, or keep people can look you up and learn more about you and um, is there anything that you'd like to tie you know what we just talked about it's like tie it back to your program yeah. or tie it back to you Susan yeah, well, at the moment, I am in transition. So, you know, we talk about the internet being our shop window. Mine resembles a badly organized charity shop at the moment. There's stuff everywhere because I've been focused on how I can help people rather than sorting everything out. So probably the easiest way is to just keep an eye. If you're interested in textile art and embroidery, you'll, you'll start to see more and more things going on there. So it's stitcherystories.com. Other than that, obviously, I'm just targeting a niche but the things that I'm helping people with, I can help anybody do that, but you can't market to anybody. So you're always very welcome for people to find me on Facebook. I'm there as Susan Weeks, LinkedIn, find me on Instagram if you're interested in textile art. Um, that's the, that's the, the easiest way. I am currently helping people to learn uh, MailChimp for email marketing. I'm, I'm running a kind of a founders members course with that as I get that sorted out and I am moving towards creating a uh, like a, a guided program I'll call it really to supporting so currently again textile artist create an online course but if you're not a textile artist and that's what you wanted to do you're going to learn exactly what you need to learn as well so that's awesome that's awesome well it's not so much who you, what you do it's who you are I think that's you know so that is a million dollar story I really really appreciate that um you know, all of you listening, I'm, I'm encouraging you to check out Susan's um, links below and, and find her. And um, of course, what I, I'd like you to, uh, I'd encourage you to look at my Facebook group. It's, it's pretty new, but we're building some audience in there and it's called um, Million Dollar Story Ninjas. It's all about your million dollar story and what you want to do with it. That's a great and, name, is that? Oh, thanks. Thanks. Um, you know, so we all have that, um, in us, so I'm, I'm here to we serve do. and, and uh, we can make the world a better place. So Susan, thanks so much. And I would love to connect with you again very soon. So thanks so much. All right, thanks Keith. All Bye right. everybody. <laughs>